Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, and by Rainex, Hum by Verizon, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome to MotorWeek Podcast number 191. I am John Davis, and joining me today in Audio Studio A for a change is writer-producer Brian Robinson. Hello, John. Online content coordinator Greg Carlos. Hey, hey. Our video producer, editor, Joe Ligo. Glad to be here. And Joe is also the producer of the podcast. We've got a new vehicle review or viewer question about minivans. Remember those? And uh, But first, we're going to go to the 2018 Paris Motor Show. Um, if you've are look, been looking at our website, you saw the coverage. We have more coming on the show itself. And I was the lucky guy that drew the uh, long straw and got to go this year. There were... Before we get into the vehicles there that were important, um, you probably know from either listening or watching Motor Week or reading the other automotive press that automotive uh, traditional auto shows seem to be on the decline with a lot of auto manufacturers avoiding them because of cost. And that indeed was the way it was at Paris, even though it's a show that happens every two years and is considered one of the crown jewels of the auto show circuit, especially in Europe, uh, a lot of brands weren't there. Ford, Nissan, uh, Volkswagen was almost absent. There, of course, was no Alfa Romeo, no Jeep, no Fiat. Uh, and a lot of, so much so that one of their main halls, number five, where there's usually standing room only, was taken up by a big dis historical display. So... It was a very quiet show in some ways, yet remarkably, there were still a lot of new vehicles that had their first public appearance there, and we even had one new automaker that never, no one had ever heard of before. So with that said, uh, we're going to kind of go around the table, and um, I'll start off just by starting the conversation. BMW seems to have the most confidence, along with Mercedes, in these big shows still, and they showed to the public the new BMW 3 Series, among others. And uh, that was the first public coming out, although we had already seen pictures and seen the specs. So from the list that you've all got before you of the different vehicles that were there, do you want to talk about any? you want to talk about the 3 Series? What's your impression of what you saw at the show? Uh, yeah, I wasn't following it too closely, but the Audi e-tron, is that finally a production one? Or yeah, It seems that we've is, been having an e-tron for six years now. It, uh, that close they have, but that is the production one. That's how I felt. I feel like we've been hearing about it for a long time. And, and this the, is the first time it's been really an SUV that I know of. I right. thought it was always something Well, else. it was a Pebble. Did that make its first yes. debut at Pebble, I that think? Pebble was the first debut. Yeah. This was its European debut. But anyway, we've been hearing about e-tron for so many auto shows. Right. Is it a concept car? And is it a no. sedan? Dan well, actual, finally, it's, it's a it's an SUV thing. And, yeah. A mid-size SUV, a Tesla X fighting SUV. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Like in the meantime, while they've been talking about it, we have Jaguars, I Pace, and then we have. I mean, Mercedes came out with theirs too. So it's yeah. just like, and Mercedes uh, is probably going to beat the e-tron to production. Yeah. So, which, which we did a segment on Motor Week recently about the to, about all the electric SUVs coming to market, and I got to say, of between the Mercedes EQC. And the Audi e-tron, I like the Audi a little bit better. Just whenever visually, it was, visually, I mean, I haven't driven it. None of us have driven them yet, but I think visually, I just think, and even looking at the specs, it just looks like it would be my choice if I was shopping in that market, which I don't know how many people are, but I, I liked it a lot more. Twenty-two. This is the U.S. alone. Twenty-two all EV vehicles are due on the market here within the next couple of years. Who's going to buy these things? That's a very good question. Millennials. And that's hopefully. I don't know. Where are they going to get them charged what, up? have at? 70 grand to drop on one of these? You know, I was in Europe for two weeks, and I saw lots of electric vehicles, a surprising number on the roads. But, of course, you got to keep it in context. It was still, still probably only less than 1%. But I saw EV chargers everywhere, and only one time did I see one vehicle hooked up to one. So all the chargers are there, but they're nobody's sitting using there, them. but nobody's using them, and you can't park there. So they're taking up parking spaces, but there's no vehicles. I don't know. Well, not to take up too much time yeah. on this, but back to your point, I think um, 
they're not the way car makers are going now is they're all starting to push especially luxury ones they're starting to push that subscription service yeah which is how millennials buy it. they don't buy anything now it's they all don't subscription so anything. i know i hear what you're saying that they're 70 grand but i don't think that's how people are going to be buying cars yeah, well, in the even, next couple of years even tesla is talking about doing a lot more leasing than what they were doing sure, yeah. before so i think you're absolutely right i i really didn't think much of the subscription thing at the beginning but as you start looking at all these very expensive vehicles, why would you want to own one? You wouldn't. Yeah, because the technology yeah. will change so quickly. Even now, people just lease them. Uh, yeah, I met a guy who leases a BMW i3 this weekend, but that's another story. Another car that stuck out to me we were talking before mm-hmm. the podcast started was the CRV Hybrid, but they wouldn't say whether or not it's coming to the U.S. It certainly looks like it's ready. I mean, you they have almost no compromise in cargo room with it. They've done a great job. Almost everything that Honda and Toyota showed there, including Lexus, was some form of a hybrid. But I looked at the CRV, and we've already gotten the the visual facelift. I just don't see any reason why it wouldn't come here. And you know, they're talking fifty four, I think, miles per gallon with it. I'm sure it will. They like yeah, to give I as, think so too. as little information as possible at these auto shows. They're ones that they're always there, but they tell you like next to nothing. The um, you know, looking down the list, there were a lot of other first, and I keep saying public debut because most of the vehicles we had seen pictures of or had been somewhere else at a small event. But the new BMW Z4 was very interesting looking. Um, more of the same, but still, I thought, the nice job. They made an awfully big deal about the return of the 8 Series. Uh, I don't, I mean, it's how long since it's been since they had? Ooh, been yeah. a minute. Yeah, long yeah. time. The... Um, Mercedes, of course, showed up with their GLE and, as you mentioned, Joe, the EQC. They also had a entry level. This is, I think, kind of a joke. Mercedes AMG GT um, with a you know four door uh, with a six cylinder engine. And I'm thinking, if you can afford that price of car, do you really want that? Uh, the Porsche Macan had a um, a mild do-over, um, the 911 Speedster, they're going to build that. They're actually going to go into production. It's pretty cool. I guess a lot of attention went over to Ferrari with their two specialized um, one- and two-seat vehicles, the Monza SP1 and the SP2, very retro, uh, almost 30-style racing vehicles. They're going to build 499 total, and buyers will have a choice between either. Yeah, and so they're they not are gonna, really sweet looking. They are pretty sweet. <laughs> the press photos are pretty cool. Uh, the Lexus RC uh, made a public debut. Um, you mentioned the hybrid, the Kia e Nero. That looks interesting. Promising for sure. Very promising. I think that's what we have a long term Nero, and we're going to be getting the plug in hybrid version. I think that that car just screams, I need an EV platform because I it think it would be perfect. And it's all, is it similar to the Konas? Because isn't Garrick. Is I believe so. Driving the yeah. Hyundai Kona EV as I we always speak. get those small platforms confused, but I know the E Nero has already been shown in Korea, and I guess basically is is getting close to production. And then, if there's nothing else you want to talk about, there we have Vinfast, the first Vietnamese auto company. It's lar- It's a. Um, it's owned by a big conglomerate there, but the particular auto section is made up of an, a lot of Americans and Europeans that are uh, have man- managerial roles. Pininfarina did the styling. But the real cool part is that they're built on last-generation BMW 5 Series sedan and X5 chassis with engines that are the last generation but lack some of the latest electronic controls. It was pretty interesting stuff. So is this, Big crowd. Did BMW just like sell them the tooling and the rights? And I'm stuff? assuming so. Uh, I honestly don't know the details, and I'm not sure they've said. But it certainly you couldn't do that any other way. They must have either bought the tooling, or have some kind of contractual arrangement. I suspect it's both. And what a intelligent move by BMW to basically get more money out of your designs. And they didn't give away a lot of the uh, most sophisticated engine controls and stuff. But, you know, the vehicles looked, um, they were big, you know, midsize, and uh, they were nicely styled. And uh, you couldn't really tell about quality. They looked good, but of course, it it's was a, an auto show. It's an SUV and, and a, a sedan. sedan. Correct. Okay, because I was going to say. With the, uh, the prefix Lux, Lux 2.0, and then 
a sedan notification and a SUV. Will they be coming to the U.S. before a Chinese company? They, that's the question. You know, that's a real good question. And you look at these and say, well, gee, they they probably could pass emissions here and everything else pretty easily. The concepts they had there looked very well done. So I wonder if they could. You know, we after all, we have an awful lot of other uh, imports from Vietnam coming in and clothing and so forth. So it's not like it would be something new. So keep an eye out Vin for fast. Vin fast. A new name propped mm-hmm. up. Any other comments about anything at Paris that you want to mention? I think we just glazed over the three series. What um, bigger, I mean, obviously all wider, new. more powerful. No manual transmission that we know of. There might be one for the diesel over there, but we probably won't see it. Eight-speed automatic. I think that that's, par for the course. Yeah, it's par for the course. Kind of a bummer, but there you are. Nice looking car. Uh, looks very uh, evolutionary. I'm sure it's you know it's a little bigger. I mean, it's so big now that they're huge. You know that the five series has got to get bigger too. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm waiting for the next one to slot in underneath. Um, there was an Audi R8 LMS GT3. I didn't spend a lot of time looking at it, but it's always nice to see that's still alive. There was a. A yellow edition, and it is yellow, of the Lexus SC. Um, There is this Infiniti Project Black S, which was based on an X60. Um, That was Infiniti's only presence there. They had nothing else. Um, They had like a little corral where automakers that didn't want to rent their own space could all group themselves together. And there were some unusual cars there that I'd never seen before. But uh, by and large, it was kind of like... you know, if you want to come to the show, but you don't want to spend any money, you go there. So, it'll be, inter- right. it'll be interesting to see how the auto show evolves as a as a thing. Well, what do you think about the Detroit plan to kind of move it to June and make it more part of a festival? I mean, that's kind of like that's like Goodwood. That's that's what they're trying to model that after. I think that it's good for the people organizing the show, but it only it depends on if the automakers are willing to spend the money to build outdoor displays and all the yeah. test tracks and all that. I mean, you know, they got to get the they got to get the automakers to show up. Yeah, I agree. The organizers too. Okay, let's move on to a couple of specific vehicles. Let's start with the 2019 Acura RDX, third generation of Acura's small RDX. Brian, you want to start? Um, yeah, it's interesting to me how when the original RDX came out, it was early in the small crossover before it was really a craze, mm-hmm. and they showed up with a turbo four-cylinder, which really no one else had. really sophisticated one. And it was super fun to drive. And uh, it was great, and people loved it. And then the next gen, they made it ginormous and bland. Put a V6 in there and made it super soft. And now they went back to the original, which now everyone else does: turbo fours and athletic, even uh, even more sporty than it was originally. I would think you can even get an A spec model, yeah. right? Yeah. And that yeah. that uh, turbo two liter is uh, pretty strong, stout. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, now it seems like they're late to the party when in, in they reality started. they, they actually started, started the party. <laughs> they got there too early. Yeah, the reason, you know, what they would tell us, and, and whether it's true or not, they said, well, you know, you guys loved the first generation, but the public didn't. They uh, they bought an Acura and opened the hood and wanted to see a six-cylinder engine. I don't know if that's true, but that was their excuse. But they went How many so Acura f- owners opened their hood? That's no, I can't believe <laughs> very many. They went so far the other direction. You know, it's like they backed off completely. So I'm happy to see this. I think it, it drives nice. It looks nice. It's it's what the RDX ought to be. It should be. This should have been the second generation RDX. I agree. They found a good balance. Um, we had the A-spec, so it was a little sportier than probably your average RDX. Super comfortable seats. Um, the heads-up display is probably the crispest one I've seen in any car. Mm-hmm. I'm talking luxury, any car. Um yeah, I just came away really impressed. I didn't like the, again, we were in A-spec and top trim, so it had the uh, one of those command pads, like you essentially oh. draw on it, which we don't like, and no, I don't, don't like either. It's a but general rule, but I'll, it actually I'll say, it wasn't as bad. Right. As, as when I some. learned how to use it, it wasn't so bad. Definitely better than a Lexus version. So. And do you think with weird features like that, 
if you were the owner of the car that you would get used to it and sure. and like it because I you know well, we're constantly like, absolutely we're but constantly just... hopping in and out of stuff and I sometimes think that you know just when we start to get the hang of something you switch cars but if you were the owner would it be a different story but you know think back to when central controllers first started you know we hated iDrive we weren't very much better about the first Mercedes but then Audi came along and they just did it better and all of a sudden we kind of all liked it. So I think execution does have a lot to do with it. And I agree with Greg. I thought, I don't like the system that Audi uses for the pad, but I thought the Acura system worked a little bit better. But, you know, I don't know what the public will, because I still felt like it took your attention. I think it's also because it's it's a bit of a dense screen. There is a lot of different selections. Yeah, so that's that's part of it. It does take some attention away from driving. Now, is your impression, since this is their own chassis for the moment, that this is the same chassis that the Passport, Honda Passport's going to use? No, I think the the Passport's just a slightly shorter pilot. It is. Yeah. So it's going to stay on the pilot. It's so just right, a two-row pilot. Right now, they're so, claiming this is their, their chassis unique to them. So. I'm sure they'll be more accurate on it. I'm Absolutely. not sure anything will get it on the Honda side as of right now. Anything else to add? Nice, Good, nice comeback on the uh, the RDX. We're all happy about that. Okay, let's move on to the 2019 Subaru Ascent. Subaru's second attempt at a three-row uh, crossover, seven or eight passengers. First on, real attempt. First real say. attempt. Uh, Tribeca, know, the Tribeca uh, went away five years ago, and you know everybody. It was the first iteration of that was pretty. I don't want to use the word ugly, but it was ugly. And then they tried to make it look bland, and it still didn't sell, and they had a six-cylinder engine. This one's got a new 2.4-liter turbo four. Seems pretty stout in horsepower. Um, I drove it uh, last night for the first time. It's a Subaru. I mean, it's so familiar because our family has an Outback, and getting from one to the other, you felt right at home. It did nothing. It didn't light any fires, but... I think it's going to be a huge hit. I have had, and Greg agreed with me, we were talking about this earlier today, I have had more people ask me about the Subaru Ascent than almost any other vehicle this year. I have friends, I have people, oh, have you driven the Ascent? Are they Subaru owners? Some of them are. Most of them tend to be. I guess my circle maybe has more Subaru owners than the average person, but just the interest in this vehicle. Well, their families are getting older. They're growing up. They need something bigger. Yeah, a and I talked to a Subaru salesperson when I was getting my car serviced. He said they had a demo in for a week, and they sold eight yeah. in a week. And it's just all these people who are moving up from Foresters that were go- originally going to Honda Pilots or Toyota Highlanders. Now they're going to a sense. And it's big. It's not quite as big as... Uh... What the uh, the Volkswagen the Atlas. Atlas, but it's, but it's got big. more space than like the Explorer yeah. and uh, most everything in that segment. So, but, um, but have you guys noticed the same level of like enthusiasm or like people asking well, you, you about it? You know, I, I've had a couple. I yeah, for that. sure. Um, when I was on the Forrester event, uh, I was talking with one of their internals, and they asked us, the journalists, a question of like, why do we think? Their brand is kind of not a resurgence, but they've really been taking off the last few years in terms of sales, and they just wanted to know why we think. Uh, I personally felt that so not only are their advertising campaigns, I think, targeted at the right people, and they're actually well executed campaigns. I just think Subaru has really hit like a tipping point, honestly, of of good products and testimonials to where finally there's so many people who realize and recognize Subaru as reliable, safe, safe. very safe. And I think like Volvo used to be safe. Yeah, it's the whole thing, the whole tipping point thing. Like it finally reached it. And now everybody's like, wow, like Subaru is what I want if I'm a family person, if I have pets, you know. I think they've made a personal connection to their buyers better than anybody else out there. You watch their ads and they make people, they make you think that they really, what's the word I'm trying to say? There's just something about the way they talk to their prospective like buyers. They know you. Like they know you, <laughs> we understand you, you're part of our family. Almost the exact opposite approach of Chevrolet. <laughs> Like they don't talk down to the customer. (laughs) They listen to the customer. They, they know they have a story and that's the whole thing with their ads. They're not selling the car. They're selling a story. They're selling a lifestyle with the car. And I think they've done a tremendous job. You know, and their vehicles do not always have all of the latest bells and whistles. Um, 
we have uh, an Outback. It's six years old now, and we bought we bought it because it fit exactly what we wanted, but it didn't have all the features that from my testing vehicles with you folks that I thought it should have. But it was reliable. Uh, it 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 was, it's nice looking. It was great for long trips. It just hit all the other. And of course, my spouse wanted something that was safe. It did well in the crash test. And she felt a connection to the brand and never had owned one before, but felt like they had more of her interest at heart. Yeah, a, a friend of mine bought was looking at it, and I guess his parents bought one, and the eyesight was a huge selling point. That's well, the first it's time I've ever system. heard somebody say safety was a yeah, main yeah. selling. You know, the whole, like, oh, safety doesn't sell, but apparently— does these days. Well, they apparently. make a big deal about the eyesight being standard, which it is, but then it's like the only safety system that's standard. Right, like, you got to pay more for almost everything else. Yeah, all the others are add-ons, so— but what about the Ascent itself? Um, okay, the only topic. thing, we had the top trim uh, level— was it touring? Touring, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. It had the uh, captain's chairs in the second row, and I was a little disappointed that they don't fold completely flat. Uh, I don't know about the bench seat. Uh, that would be a killer for me. Didn't seem like a ton of leg room back there either, honestly. Uh, the uh, engine's uh, throttle, and I think Brian mentioned this first to me, the very temperamental throttle very it's super touchy yeah, yeah they, may, they you. want you to feel wow. it's like it's really powerful so you just breathe on the throttle and it takes off but then once you stay on the throttle then it like slows way down and you gotta get back on the throttle it's kind of annoying. i mean you get used to it if it's your car but it is but i thought for a lot of people they're going to find that a little too touchy they'll probably think oh i got a huge amount of power right. but i thought it was a little touchy seats are hard nice looking typical very subaru hard, typical yeah. subaru um I couldn't get a couple of the uh, dash displays to work, but that's probably just my ignorance. So. Uh, but drives nice. Drives kind of steering's rather numb. Like you said, I mean, if you didn't know you weren't in an Outback, you you yeah, would just think you, you're in an you'd Outback. Think in a big yeah. Outback. That was actually uh, my wife Cheryl' first reaction. She walked out and said, "Wow, this is like a big Outback." And I said, "Well, yeah." Great visibility, like every Subaru, yeah. you can see. Everywhere around you. The um, the evolution of their instrument panel, I think, has been a good one. Uh, the controls seem to be – there's more redundancy with the touchscreen. Uh, uh, things seem to be a little bit better placed. There wasn't as much stuff hidden. I like that they've moved the parking brake down on the console, which is not brand new, but not every vehicle they, has had that. Uh, I don't know. I liked it. I thought it was going to – you know, buy with those few caveats, I think it's going to do really well. Yeah, I. Yeah, they'll sell a ton of them. Yeah, that's, yeah that was one of my. Okay, uh, so Subaru Ascent. Our viewer question this is uh, from Charles, and we sort of talked about it at the beginning. It teased it. He says that he is unusual. He's in the minivan market. Actually, you're not. They still sell, what, about half a million a year? He's interested in the Toyota Sienna because it has the optional all wheel drive system, but he's also looking at the Honda Odyssey and Chrysler Pacifica. Which one would you choose? And I bet we get at least three different answers here. Wow. Well, I mean, they keep saying there's a new Sienna coming out, but I think after the Pacifica came out and then they said there was one coming out and then Odyssey came out, I think they keep going back to the drawing board. But eventually there'll be a new Sienna out. I would probably be interested in that. But as of right now, I would definitely get the Odyssey. And I wouldn't worry about not having all-wheel drive. Just get some decent winter tires, and you'll do just as well as that Sienna does with all-wheel drive. Anybody else? I liked our long-term Pacifica a little bit more than the Odyssey. Um, the Stone Go is a big thing. but Also, also the mid, the second-row seats don't fold in our, in our uh, Odyssey. In the Odyssey, Odyssey, which kind of right. drives me crazy. And, uh, you know, if you're a person who likes styling, I, the two— uh, the, the Pacifica is definitely the better looking of the, between the Odyssey and the Sienna, but I don't know if that's what you think about when you buy a minivan. I think a lot of people think about quality, and I think in that aspect, the Odyssey probably well, has, the, yes. has the edge. That's, yes, definitely. That's how I felt. Yeah. Um, I liked our Pacifica a lot at the beginning, but after a year, you could definitely see where some things weren't holding up as well, whereas the Odyssey, everything's pretty much as it was Same when we got one. it. Yeah, I mean, it drives great. Uh I would probably go Odyssey, but I will say, and you, I'm not sure if uh, if Charles is into the plug-in hybrid, but 
I was really impressed with the Pacifica plug-in hybrid, as a lot of people Except were. you lose the Stow&Go. Which is a big seller and, of the yeah, Pacifica. I guess the Stow&Go is the reason I would buy the Pacifica. Yeah. Yeah. And without that, it's like, well, okay, it's kind of back to the drawing board. But it, I guess, yeah, I w- it depends on what he's trying to do. I mean, if you're... if you're, uh, Yeah, you if know, you're just going to carry people yeah, it's and don't really care about the um, easy flexibility because the Sienna doesn't have... You know, any the easy flexibility. But, of the but if he does want the all-wheel drive, you mentioned earlier, John, the ground clearance on the Pacifica, especially, is pretty low. It's very low. So you know, it, depending on where you live, that could be a real downer. Yeah. Whereas I guess the all-wheel drive Sienna might be a little higher off the ground. But I, I think know. it was Brian or somebody said before we went on the air that you know, if you're worried about traction, just get some decent tires. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could. Put uh, some... overall, I'm not saying all wheel drive is not necessary in some cases, but it's so overrated as far as what people think they need to, in the wintertime. Or, or a quote unquote off road, on a dirt yeah. road. Decent set of winter tires will, on front wheel drive is usually just as good. I've been taking the Odyssey we have here up some very steep grades that are often very muddy or covered with wet leaves. And sure, if you basically stop on the a steep incline and try to go with too much throttle, you're going to spin. But if I had different tires on it, I could probably not have any problem. If I can make it up the hills that I put that vehicle through with a front-wheel drive and the factory tires, just anybody can. So There you go. All right. Well, Charles, I hope that probably doesn't answer your question completely. My final advice is... Go test each one of them, drive them around, get a good test drive, and make your determination. And, Odyssey. Mm-hmm. and you'll probably buy the Odyssey. The yeah. Uh, rant and rave time. And um, anything making any of us angry or happy? I've always got something, but again. Well, go ahead. Um, uh so when you're in, when you're coming to a stoplight and there's a straight lane, a left turn lane, and maybe sometimes a right turn lane, I'll ask this first. So how close is appropriate to get to the car in front of you when you're stopping? I mean... A car, you should leave a car length. Are you talking about when you come when to you a When you come stop? to a complete stop yeah, at a stoplight. I, I usually leave a car length. A but, full car length? Yeah. But no one, everyone uses like six inches yeah, now. I use about, yeah. I'll leave maybe 10 feet. I, I, I leave way too I much. Leave quarter, I leave a quarter See, of a car length. and here's my argument against that, is why would you leave so much space? And some people do go too close but oh yeah some when you people, have a lane basically... like that but when you're coming down like and you're coming from like a single lane that then goes into three then if you're There's not, not if you're leaving space, too much right. space then people can't get into the that's, left turn lane correct. or the right turn you're lane correct. so you got to have like a situational awareness which i'm sure yeah do, i wouldn't right? hog up a lane yeah not exactly i think there's a lot of people who just don't understand but what's hap- what are you seeing that people are that leaving... people are way too far away from the car in really? front of them and so therefore you have no with, place in to, that situation you have no place to stop you Except have, blocking the lane. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, just, and so then, I what? Just was so then when the left arrow turns green, you can't get over to the left exactly, hand turn because, lane. Exactly. Because so uh, left hand turn lane's empty, and you're sitting. Right. You're sitting 50 yards and, back. In and that can't situation, I'm not saying ride the other person's bumper, but you know, maybe scoot up a little bit to give a person a chance to get by. Because ultimately, you want to get traffic moving, and sometimes it's impossible if you're giving a car length or so. But that's just my piece. My. I have a gripe that seems to be getting worse, and maybe it's just people on their phones, but I notice so many people driving down the middle of the lanes. Yes. I mean, you know, straddling two lanes is what I'm saying. Straddling the center lines when you've got two lanes in each direction. And it's and taking turns that way, and it's like hogging the whole road. Now, do you think they're on their phones and they're just it's just happening because they're not paying attention? But it seems to be getting worse. People seem to treat center lines like a suggestion, it seems. I think it's honestly a distraction. It's getting so bad. <laughs> like, really bad. I agree. They're, like, stressed out about which lane to get in when they get to the stop sign, I guess. <laughs> They're worried about making me mad. Maybe, maybe it's time to, for, to, to rethink podcast. about driver's education in this country. Well, all right. Uh, I think that's going to pretty much uh, wrap up our podcast number 191 for today. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. I'd like to thank all of our panelists. 
uh, Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, Joe Ligo, of course. Joe's also been the producer of the podcast. Our audio engineer today is the one and only David Wainwright, and our podcast creator is Bob Mixter. We want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your day or evening to listen to our Motor Week podcast and to watch Motor Week on public TV stations around the country and also on the Velocity Channel. Till next time, I'm John Davis for Motor Week and all of us here. Thanks very much for being a part of Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, and by Rainex, Hum by Verizon, and State Farm.